Good morning and welcome to Rose Red Homestead. Um, we absolutely love our community. Our focus is on food security, self-reliance, and emergency preparedness. And we just have wonderful folks who have subscribed and who leave comments for us. And uh, some of those comments are requests for videos. This is a very important video, and this was requested by Lexi Lou. So thank you, Lexi Lou. Um, she is a fairly new canner and uh, commented that I always start our pressure canning videos by putting food in the jar and wants to know what, how do you get the jars ready. And so we are going to do this video today on basic pressure canning and um, from start to finish. And so you see I have a pretty bare counter here. You don't see any food. You don't see anything except a brand new case of jars. So we're going to start with this and I will get, be giving all kinds of hints as we go forward in just a moment. My favorite jars are wide mouth jars. They're getting a little hard to find and pretty expensive. But you know what? When it costs me $17 for one package of 12 um, lids, which is absolutely ridiculous, and I can get a, a, a case of um, wide mouth jars with the lids and rings on them already for not a whole lot more than that, this is what I'm going to opt to do when we can find them. And Jim found some of these. So I'm going to start with a brand new case of jars to show you how we do this. Um, we live in an earthquake zone and so our uh, pantry is fitted with some things that will help prevent damage of our uh, jarred food in the event of an earthquake and we are going to show that to you um, Just not today. So when I start with a brand new uh, case of jars I keep the box and not only do I keep the box I like the plastic that is around the box because it makes it sturdier So I will just poke my scissors in right here and then run them along the edge of the box And that way the box is covered with plastic that helps hold it together and helps it last just a little bit longer. It's always important to wash your jars. Now, these are brand new from the factory. I treat them the very same way as I would if I were getting empty canning jars off our food storage shelves as well. So um, our empty canning jars out there, um, don't have new rings and lids, that's the difference. So I'm going to put these, I have a sink of hot water ready to go, and that little explosion was the um, lid popping loose from the jar. Sometimes it does explode just a little bit. And I'm only going to need seven of these jars. We're going to be doing seven quarts of food today. And um, our um, video today is on, um, Lexi also requested that we do more meals in jars, and so I'm kind of combining these two things together. We are going to put up today a recipe that is a chicken mix that can be used for several meals, and so most of the meal is right in this jar. This is a very versatile recipe. And um, we'll share with you some of the things that um, it can be used for. Okay, so I'm just going to take, I have a nice bottle brush, and uh, this water is very hot. USDA says that we no longer need to uh, sanitize jars if um, they're going to be processed for 10 minutes or more. So this is my process. I'm gonna put seven jars out here. Now the order that I do things is important. Um, at all costs, I want to preserve the um, safety of the food. So I'm not dealing with the food right now when I have other things that I have to do first. So we'll come back when I have all these jars, lids and rings washed and out here to drain. Uh, Jim suggested that I show how to do the lids and rings too, so I just toss them in the soapy water as well and scrub the lid off. 
with um, the brush and the inside of the ring. And so we'll be right back when these are done. The alternative to doing what I just did would be to put those jars in your dishwasher and have the dishwasher clean them as well. That is a very fine alternative. Either way you want to do it, the jars need to be clean. It does not matter. We are doing raw pack today. The jars do not have to be hot. They can be room temperature and no problems with having the jars room temperature with what we're going to do. I want to show you my canner. This is my canner. It is the only canner that I recommend. It is not the only pressure canner that I use. It is the only one that I recommend, and I'm not an official recommender by any stretch of the imagination. I do use others, but this one is my go-to canner. I know that it is very safe. I know that I can count on it. This is a pressure canner. Um, I just want to talk to you about a couple of things. Mine is a dial canner, which means that as the pressure rises, it shows what the pressure is on the inside of the canner. Now, what we want is, um, with pressure canning, the processing time is constant, regardless of your elevation. If it says 30 minutes, you do 30 minutes, whether you are at sea level or at, we're at 5,000 feet, or even higher, the processing time is the same. What changes, what the variable is in pressure canning, is the amount of pressure that it takes to get the temperature on the inside of the canner up high enough to get the food in the jars into the kill zone to, uh, for long enough in order to kill any botulism spores if any happen to be present. The probability of that is very low, but we don't take any chances. We pretend, we think about, boy, if there's even one in there, I don't want it left so that it can produce the toxin. So we want to do safe canning all the way around. Uh, pressure canning is very safe. It is very easy in this kind of a pressure canner. We just need to be sure that for the processing time, and our processing time today is an hour and a half. Once it gets up to, at our elevation, it takes 13 um, PSI, pounds per square inch. Um, above us, 7,000 feet, um, it takes a full 15 pounds of pressure, or maybe it's 8,000 anyway, up above us, it takes 15 pounds of pressure. If you are at sea level, it takes about 10, 11 PSI. Now, some pressure canners don't have this. Instead, they have a weight. It is a gauged weight, and the weight will say on it either 10 or 15. When I first started canning, you could get weights that said 5, 10, or 15. But I think pretty much now it is 10 or 15. And so because it requires 13 pounds of pressure where we are, I can't use the 10. Instead, I would bump it up to the 15. And so when we are canning, we like that needle to be between 13 and 15. If it goes below 13, you're going to want to start your time over again because it's very important that in the kill zone, the duration is sustained and not dip below and then come back up. It has to be sustained. And um, once you learn your canner and learn your stove and how the two interact with each other, um, you can pretty much tune your ear to be sure that everything is going okay. This dead weight does not, it's not a 10, it's not a 15, it's a dead weight. So it goes over this little vent hole, and we'll show you what that's for in just a little bit. So during processing, this holds the pressure in. Now this is a safety as well, because if you forget your pressure canner is, your canner is going, um, and the pressure gets way too high in here, two things are going to happen. This little thing is going to blow and let the pressure out there, and this can shoot off and let the pressure out there. It saves it from exploding. So all you'll have is steam coming out and maybe a mess on your ceiling if you cook inside. We cook outdoors. My stove top is an induction top. This is aluminum. Aluminum does not work on induction. So Jim has a, a set up for us a really nice canning station outside with a propane stove. And um, the weight stays on here. If it starts to go when um, we're canning, that means that the pressure has reached 15. And I can listen to that. And I know, uh oh, I need to go check the flame 
maybe turn it down a little bit because pressure is starting to escape. This is a safety release at about 15 PSI. It won't explode off, not explode, wrong word. It won't shoot off um, unless it gets much, much, much higher than that as a, as a safety. Uh, this will blow first. Okay, so what's the next step? Um, inside the cannon, I have, I have two racks. Um, you always have a rack in the bottom of your canner. You never, ever, ever put jars on the um, floor of the canner without separating them from the floor with a little rack. The reason that I have two is that I can pack one layer of pints and then I can put this down on that layer of pints halfway down and then I can stack another layer of pints. For quartz, I don't need it, so I'm going to set it aside. My canner, you can probably see the water ring around the edge, calls for about three inches of water. Every canner must have water in it, whether you do water bath or whether you do pressure canning. Um, for pressure canning, you don't need to bring it up way, way high, cover the jars. You only need three or four inches in the bottom, and that is because you want to produce the steam. The steam um, under pressure is what raises that temperature up to get the food into the kill zone. So be sure that you put water in the bottom of your canner. All right, now we're going to set this aside. <clears throat> what I try to do when I'm getting ready to can for the day is I think about how long is it going to take me to process the food and get it ready to put in the jars. If it is going to take a long time, an hour, then I do everything I can that doesn't work with food to get ready so that when I'm working with food, I can finish the processing and then get it right in the jars and get it canned so the food doesn't sit out for a long time while I wash the jars or get the canner ready. So once the jars are ready and I have the canner on standby here, um, then I'm ready to start working with the food. I do not put water in the canner and put it out on the stove to start heating up to a simmer until I'm ready to fill the jars. So we're just going to set the canner aside and then we're starting to work with the food. Um, I am not going to put you through watching me prepare all of these because I'm going to assume that you know how to chop carrots, potatoes, celery, onions, and chicken pieces. Uh, these have been waiting for us in the refrigerator. But it would be at this point that I would do all of that to prepare for the, what we're going to do next. So I have carrots. I have potatoes in water. I have celery. And I have onions, and these onions, we grew these onions, I'm so pleased to say. And I have chicken. And then, in addition to that, I have the spices that we're going to use to put in the jars, and I have the chicken broth ready to heat up so that it will be ready when we're ready to put it in the jars. Now, because we're now ready to begin putting food in the jars, I am going to go ahead and start the broth on the stove. This is my home canned chicken broth. So um, I'm, I have three quarts ready. I just have going to start with two quarts. I never know. I never know for sure how much it's going to take. So I always give it the smell test to be sure it is still okay. And it is, it smells just fine. This, this was only bottled. I'm, I'm now about out of chicken broth. I'm gonna need to do some more. Uh, this was put up in uh, July of this year, so that's only been a couple of months ago. All good. Okay, and it will be all ready for us when uh, we are ready for it. So this recipe is like a chicken stew base. Um, when you pour it out of the jar, you can use the liquid and make gravy, and then you'll have this beautiful chicken and gravy that you can put over potatoes or rice. That would be one thing that you could do with it. The other thing, uh, the two things that I'm going to demonstrate um, after uh, our canning is over and we uh, will open up one of the jars. We're going to make chicken pot pies 
with a chicken mix and also we're going to do um, chicken and dumplings and so those are the two meals that we will show at the very end of the video so here is uh, what we do I'm going to drain these potatoes the reason the potatoes are in water is to keep them from turning brown so I'm just going to drain them now Okay, when I, when I chopped up these vegetables, because I'm going to be putting a half a cup of each one of these, I chopped them up and measured them one half cup proportion at a time so that I would cut up about the right amount instead of just trying to guess. For the meat, and this is a tested recipe in the Ball Blue Book, um, it calls for a, about a pound of meat, and um, so I have a almost 15 ounces of meat per jar. That's not quite a pound, but it's enough for us. And the rest will be made up with some other things. Um, with a tested recipe, you like to follow it as close as possible, particularly the ratio of solids to the liquid. So we'll pay attention to that. So here's what I'm gonna do. I have, um, I have my kitchen scale here because I only have so much meat and I want it to go into all seven jars. So uh, knowing that I'm going, I want to have about 15 ounces of meat, I'm going to start with the meat in the bottom. Okay, so it's about this much meat. Tamp it down just a little bit. And then um, very quickly, I'm going to do a half a cup of each of these vegetables. Now, if I were doing this not on camera, I would put meat into every jar, and then I would fill every jar with celery and each one of the things so that it would be a little bit more efficient. I'm not gonna do that in front of the video today because I'm not gonna put you through that whole long thing. And so then on top of this, I will uh, put one teaspoon of uh, poultry seasoning which you can substitute other things for if you wish. And then I'm gonna put just a little bit of pepper, maybe about a, a fourth of a teaspoon, too much. And some salt, probably about a half a teaspoon. And this jar is now ready for the broth. We're not ready to put the broth in it, but it's ready for the broth. So I'm gonna set it aside. While we were off camera, right as I started putting the rest of the food in the jars, uh, Jim put the canner out and started it on um, a, a low heat so it will be just simmering when we get out there. We'll show that to you when we get out there. Everything is filled. The great thing about this recipe is that the jars are clear and you can double check to be sure you put all your ingredients in. Jim found one that I had forgotten to put salt in, so that was a good thing. Now, uh, we are now ready to um, fill these jars with the broth, so... I use my little silicone measuring cup for that. It works just perfect. And I leave headspace up to that first ring, which isn't quite an inch, but it's close enough. Seems to work well for me. And then we will debubble and see where we are. Okay, let's debubble. Now I just use a little plastic implement. Actually, I'll use the handle side that does not have the serrations on it. Important to get the air out if we possibly can. Especially down there where that chicken is. We want broth to get in there and push all the air out. The broth is now a little bit below where it was before. And that is what we want to see. We'll put more in when I get everything all debubbled. So the reason that we debubble, 
the broth is now here when it was right here. So there was a lot of air down in that chicken. So that's exactly what we want to do. Now I am just um, refilling, um, bringing the broth back up to that one lip. Okay, now because we are using broth, which probably has some fat in it, and because there's chicken in the bottom, we're going to wet our wiping paper towel with a little vinegar. Vinegar really cuts the grease and the oil, and uh, in order to give the, the uh, lid every chance of sealing, we want to just really do a good job of wiping off these rims. Okay, now, the next step then is to put the lids on, and then the rings finger tight. And finger tight is just that. Don't use your wrist, just your fingers. Because the steam still has to get out of that jar. This is the canning station that Jim has put together for me with this nice windbreak because we're using a flame and uh, we want to keep that flame steady. So if you'll come over here and take a look in the canner, you'll see that we have um, three inches of watery th the water that is just barely simmering, it's steaming, you can see the bubbles coming up from the bottom a little bit. So this is the perfect uh, temperature of the water. The jars are not super hot, even though that broth was boiling when we put it in. The food was raw pack, and so it was not heated. And so we don't want to put the jars um, in a, uh, a super boiling canner. All right, now this will hold seven quarts, so we're going to put all seven quarts in. Come look in the canner and see about how high the water is. If your water comes up higher than that, um, take some jars out and then empty a little bit of water out. It does not need to come up to the lid level at all. All we want to do is just to make some steam. Okay, now I'm going to be turning the um, flame up a little bit to medium, and then we're going to put the lid on, and we'll tell you what comes next. All right, a couple of things to note on the canner. Um, the pressure is at zero. No steam is coming out of that vent. The airlock, which is right over here, will rise up when there's pressure in the bottom of the canner. None of that has happened yet. So it is now on medium. It's going to start heating up faster. And when it starts to boil and shoot steam out this vent, we want it to vent for 10 full minutes with steam shooting out of here, and we'll show you that. Because what we want to have happen is the air inside the canner needs to be replaced by that steam. It is the steam in connection with the pressure that gets the temperature up high enough to get the food into the kill zone. So when we get to that point, we'll be back. It'll be just a few minutes. Here the canner is venting. You can see it. You can hear it. We have timed it. It has now vented for 10 minutes, so there is um, no air left in the canner. It is now completely filled with steam. So I'm going to take the dead weight and put it right over the vent. And so notice also that this little button is now pressurized and pushing up, and the airlock is also up. So we know it's pressurized, and the dial says we're already up to almost five pounds of pressure. So we're going to wait until it gets over to 13 pounds of pressure, which is right here. And as soon as it does, we will start our timing. The timing has to go, these are quarts, has low acid foods, including chicken, which is meat. So it goes for 90 minutes. And so um, it should get up there in just the next few minutes. And we will start that timing. And then uh, once the timing is completely done, the hour and a half is finished, we turn the heat off under the canner and we let it cool down normally. And that takes another about 45 minutes for this canner. And so we're going to come back then when we're finished with everything and ready to take them out of the canner. It's about three minutes since we just left the last segment and we're letting it go up to 15 so that you can see what happens. Below 15, this does not jiggle. So this is telling us, come and check, come and check. It's already up to 15, it might go higher. And so we're going to come out and adjusting the flame here or adjusting your electric burner is really important. And um, being at 15 is not going to hurt anything. It's not going to explode. It's still it, we still have plenty of safety. Notice how the rocking is slowing down now that we've turned the heat down. The needle is starting to drop just a little bit. And we want to find that sweet spot on the stove where it is holding between 13 and 15. It's really hard to hold it at 
a single level. You can go higher. So if you think about holding it within a range, that works just fine. So now it's almost completely stopped. It's at 14 now. And we're okay to let it sit for the rest of the time right there. We come out and check it all the time because things change. But um, I probably come out about every five or 10 minutes once we get it stabilized, which it almost is right now. All right, we'll come back when it's all finished. It has taken a little over an hour for it to get completely cool. Well, it's still not cool, but the pressure's all the way down. And I know that because this is not puffed up because the airlock is all the way down and I can test it by tilting this and no pressure is coming out. So it is now safe to open the lid. You always open the lid away from your face. So we tilt it this way so the steam goes the opposite direction. So let's see what we have. Okay, that's fine. It's gunky on the inside. Chicken sometimes does that, but it looks really, really good. We did not get siphoning there. And no siphoning there, so that's good. We have had a little siphoning, I can tell by looking at the water. So when these cool down some, we can take a look at the jars and see if dramatic siphoning has occurred. Sometimes happens. So come take a look at the water and you can see that siphoning has occurred. So it's not perfectly clean the way it should be. It's a little bit greasy on the top. So that means that one or more of these jars has leaked out a little bit. Um, and don't be concerned when that happens. Sometimes it happens and nobody knows why. Um, maybe it would have been better had we left them in another five minutes. I don't know. They're going to be fine. Um, if, it, if the water siphons out more than halfway down, that's when you should open it and use it right then. So we are going to let these cool for several hours and then we'll be back to show you a couple of meals that you can use with them. So we'll be back. It is the next day. Canning is done. We had a very successful batch. We have seven sealed jars of product. And so there was indeed just a little bit of siphoning. Um, if you get a real close look up of that, this is our worst one. We lost maybe a half an inch of liquid right here. We could tell that from the water. And you know what? It just happens sometimes. And I really do not even get concerned about it at all. Um, and there's our oven. Um, unless the siphoning has uh, dropped the liquid down to below the halfway mark and then the USDA says that it is a problem. So what's next with these meals? Well, these can stay on your shelf for a good year, maybe more, and anytime you want to you can just take one down and you have a number of, um, of uh, choices that you can do with it. We're going to open one right now and before I put these outside on the shelf, I leave my bands on, but I loosen them. Um, and so I loosen them so that they're very loose. I just don't have a place to store 600 bands. And so I leave them on the jars, but I loosen them so the same thing can happen if it needs to break seal, which is what the USDA is concerned about. Now, when I open a jar of um, low acid canned food, there are some things that I do. First of all, I listen to see that it goes st, st, and so the air is being sucked right back in, and then I smell it, and then if possible, I cook it for 10 minutes just in case there might be any toxin in here, which probability is just almost zero. But I like to boil it for about 10 minutes, which takes care of the toxin. And the toxin is not the same as the spores. Um, toxin can be destroyed at boiling temperature. Okay, so let's see. Yes, that was the right sound. And now the smell test, and it smells fabulous. So what I want to do is to thicken this up. Um, this is uh, going to be a stew-like meal, and so I'm just going to pour the uh, liquid right in this pot. And remember, the liquid that we used was broth, and I'll bring this over in a second so you can see it. We had a couple of loose carrots, but that is the chicken broth mixed with the juices from the cooking vegetables and the chicken. Now what I want to do, and I do the solids separately, I like to thicken the um, uh, liquid part 
uh, before I add in the rest. And I just have a flour and water slurry right here. So I'm going to put a little bit in what, um, what I think is about the right amount and stir it around. And then um, we're going to take this over to the stove, heat it up, and see what we get. So I'll meet you over there. All right, Jim didn't realize that he had not turned the camera on, but um, the liquid thickened up just fine and I put the solids in and they're now heating. I've broken up the chicken just a little bit and um, I explained that once this heats up, it is a meal just like this. You can put it in a bowl and have it for chicken stew if you would like to do that. You can serve it over noodles or rice or mashed potatoes if you would prefer to do that. The two things that I'm going to show you today with this mix are chicken and dumplings um, and I've got a couple of uh, pie crusts over there ready to make chicken pot pie. So this is now warm enough that I can put that into the uh, pie shells and so let's meet back over there and do that. The oven is at 375. It dinged just a minute ago so the oven is completely ready and so I'm just going to go ahead and um, take a scoop and put it in each of these little pot pies. These pot pies are smaller than what I would normally do just because we're doing it for illustrative purposes. And so um, I have bigger um, individual pots that I would use. So that leaves this much for our um, um, chicken and dumplings. But right now what I'm going to do is take these top crusts and just put them in place like this. and just run around the edge. And so we have that finished. I'm just going to do the little fork tine mashing. And these are ready to go in the oven. I'll finish that one in a minute. And so here, on top of the rest of this um, chicken stew, I'm going to um, put some this is just a quick little biscuit mix that I made up just a little while ago. And there are different ways that you can do chicken and dumplings. This way is like with a little dumpling on the top. Um, you can make this dough up into uh, what looks like noodles and just in incorporate it down into the um, rest of the pot. So it's just like part of the stew. But I grew up on dumplings like this, where they sat on the top. And um, so these, we'll put this back over there on the stove and let this gently simmer for probably 15 or 20 minutes until the biscuit dough is completely done. And when everything is all done, we will come back and we'll show you the results. So we will see you in just a little while. I wish you could be here to smell this house. It just smells wonderful with the um, chicken pot pies baked in the oven. I just took them out and they're beautiful. And then take a look at our chicken and dumplings. Those dumplings are perfect. They're all the way done, nice and fluffy. And I just made a chopped salad. So we are ready to eat. So thank you for being with us with this video. Hope you've enjoyed this. Hope it will help you have a lot more confidence in your pressure canning and we're going to do some more just like this. So we will see you next time.